I'm Dr. Barb Smith, Chief Development Officer here at American Reading Company, and I'm delighted to spend an hour with all of you and with our um, speakers, Dave and Meredith Lieben and Sue Pimentel. You're really in for a great conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about knowledge building curriculum. Seems like knowledge building is the word we hear all the time right now, but what does it really mean? And how can you dive into that and understand it better? Use it in your context. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speakers this afternoon. First, Sue Pimentel. Sue's been involved for decades in just about any major literacy initiative in this country that's had legs, to be honest. Um, Sue has been the founding partner of the Student Achievement Partners, also co-founder of Standards Works, both organizations that have been really impactful for educators in the United States. She has a way of helping folks through complex issues in common sense, um, in a common sense manner. And next, we're joined by the Liebens, David and Meredith, who've been working together and living together for more than 30 years here. Um, these are folks who walk the talk, who have been working in schools all over this country and continue to do so um, as guests. One of the things I really appreciate that appreciate is that their words of wisdom are being translated into really usable books. Um, first, Know Better, Do Better, Teaching the Foundation So Every Child Can Read was their first of the Know Better, Do Better series. And folks were clamoring for more. Their new book is going to be coming out, Know Better, Do Better, Comprehension. And we're finding as folks think about Science of Reading 2.0 or moving beyond this first um, wave of phonics into a more fuller view of the science of reading, comprehension is still pretty mysterious. And so I think you're going to find this really usable. I'm gonna turn it over um, to our speakers. And to kick us off, I think I just like to pose one question. And I think David, you're, I believe you're up first. Could you, could you talk a little bit about the research around knowledge building? and how that um, impact the design principles for knowledge building curriculum that are really taking hold today? Well, the, res the, the, the research for knowledge being part of literacy and part of comprehension was first done by cognitive scientists. I, I believe the first study was um, somewhere in the neighborhood of the mid 1980s, which is kind of surprising because we, the educational community didn't discover the importance of knowledge until sometime in the 2020s, but cognitive scientists discovered it um, in in the mid 19 in the mid 1980s. So that research has been around quite a bit. Um, a review of all the multiple, really hundreds of articles, was done by. Uh, it's in our it's. I don't know if we're going to have resources here, but it's Cervetti and Wright. It was a study done in fairly recently, I think, in 2000, certainly in the 2020s, that reviewed hundreds of studies um, connecting knowledge to comprehension. And in, in its conclusion was that, in essence, students' knowledge is one of the single most important co contributors to successful comprehension. And I don't know if we're gonna have um, a, a access to some of these studies, but I'm sure- We absolutely I will, David. Um, one of the things we'll do is follow up with links and resources and also post them on our YouTube channel. So people can follow up on um, the information that you're sharing and use it back in their districts. Very good, that'll save you a lot of time. There's no reason to start reading all of the hundreds of studies one by one. Some of them, frankly, are very effective, but freaking boring. Um, so just take the review of all these studies and that will give you a good picture. But the most well-known study is called the baseball study um, by RECT, R-E-C-H-T. 
And it's very straightforward. Uh, it took kids who um, read a passage about baseball. And some of those some of those students were reading at an eighth grade level. Some of those students were reading literally at a, at a third grade level. Um, and then they assessed their comprehension of the text. And the students who were reading at a third grade level, um, but knew more about baseball, did just as well as the students who were reading at an eighth grade level, um, who knew more about baseball or knew less about baseball. But in other words, the knowledge of the topic elevated students reading as much as five grade levels, which is kind of stunning. What's also really interesting about that research, everybody everybody refers to the rec baseball study. Well, actually it was the second one. Someone did one before that. Um, and then it was replicated with soccer, two, also two times. So you have four studies uh, of the nature of showing that your reading level is intimately connected to, to your knowledge level. We can take all those studies and all that research and look at it, and that's a good thing. But you know something else? It kind of makes sense. If you don't know much about the world, at some point you're going to reach you're going to reach a, a state where you're not going to be able to read very much because there will be references to people and places and institutions and organizations and ideas and concepts. And if you don't know anything about them, then you're not going to be able to understand that text. So knowledge is essential to comprehension. Now, in terms of what to look at in a high quality curriculum that enhances, that grows knowledge, well, let's start at a very basic level. The topics need to be, it needs to be topics. It needs to be topics about knowledge. It could be about insects, invertebrates, ships, sports, um, really anything but it's about topics that enhance knowledge of the world. That kind of makes sense. And since the Common Core Standards called for half, half of what students read being informational text, which means that's what's in the tests, half, then many programs have more topics now than they used to. Many do, in fact, have half topics. But if it's a truly knowledge-based- Half informational text. Half informational. If it's truly knowledge-based, then the, the, the knowledge is, coherent. You don't just jump from presidential elections to tree kangaroos. You move within some kind of coherent sequence. If you're going to do amphibians, you introduce amphibians. You talk about some of the most commonly known amphibians, whether it's salamanders or toads or tree frogs, etc. And that's a coherent building of knowledge. There are programs that claim they do that, and they don't do that. They jump around from topic to topic, or they confuse. They get confused between a topic and a theme. Second thing, this should not be a shocker, but if you've got a knowledge-based curriculum and you want to grow knowledge, ask questions about knowledge. Don't only ask questions about standards or don't only ask questions about strategies. Ask many questions about knowledge. Another shocker, make sure the kids understand the text. Um, make sure that because if they don't understand the text, there's less they're going to learn about knowledge, uh, about the topic. And also let that knowledge come from reading. Don't do what we have done for much of our educational lives. Um, we come across a topic that's informational text that some of the kids don't have the information. Then we tell them what they need to know. And we tell them what, what's in this text. That's not that helpful because kids won't learn to learn on their own. So those are some of the key principles of what would be in a knowledge-based curriculum. Do any of my esteemed colleagues want to add anything? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, so just underscoring it, when David talked about a topic on amphibians or anything, uh, civil war or whatever it is, that, that one, that it be more narrowly drawn, right? So it's coherent, but also that it be sustained. So it's not just a read one book, um, or if it's a long book, if it's a whole book with many chapters, that can work, but you're doing it over two weeks, three weeks time where you're really digging in. And also that the writing that students are doing connects with it. The talking that students are doing connects with it. And if they're doing, we'd love to see a volume of reading. I, I know ARC has that, um, where then one text bootstraps another. So as David was talking about when authors don't write, tell you everything, right? They leave spaces. They think we know things when we read something of theirs. But if you're reading on the topic, uh, then you kind of you get the vocabulary, you get the concepts, and you're going to see them again. And one text bootstraps another, which doesn't happen in a level text program. 
just to say it. So those are my two cents. Actually, at least a quarter's worth. <laughs> and I would just add, this is also might go without saying, but it, it doesn't because it doesn't always happen. This is an equity move because what, what has happened, the baseball study was random. It was, those kids didn't get their knowledge of baseball in school from their reading, from their knowledge-rich curriculum. They carried it randomly from home or from their experience playing, um, getting to play baseball or studying baseball. So that's what we always we really have tried to shed the notion of background knowledge because a knowledge rich curriculum builds the knowledge at school with everybody in a social way. And that is a huge equity move because it is no longer counting on the randomized experiences children can bring in and which inevitably privileges kids who have robust experiences that align well with academic learning. So um, I, I'm surprised we didn't touch on the the, the equally robust connection between uh, knowledge and, and vocabulary, but but words name things, right? And they name ideas. So the more you know, you name that with words. And the other connection is um, academic, tier two vocabulary, the, the, the words that embellish and enrich and, and make the language more specific um, are carried with these knowledge topics. But and if you know the thing, if you know the topic, you're much more likely to notice the nuances and the meaning conveyed by the tier two words. So there's a really powerful corollary um, between knowledge building and vocabulary. And David can say his line about reading and vocabulary. Oh, <laughs> well, after a great deal of research, um, many cognitive scientists have come to the conclusion that reading has a lot to do with words especially if you know the meaning of those words. Yeah. True enough. And I just want to underscore one thing that Meredith said, because a lot of times I've looked at lessons or curriculum and they talk about activating um, students' knowledge, which is good, but we're talking about building students' knowledge too. And that's, 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 there's a real difference there. You know, I know one of the things I noticed is I'm listening to everybody uh, one around equity move, you know, it, it's popular for many years to say, you know, uh, student success regardless of zip code. And those things are often just like a bumper sticker. There's nothing behind it. It's, it's an aspiration. Knowledge building curriculum is one way to deliver that. Um, and I think your point about building knowledge and then also using it um, is really, really powerful. David, you talked a lot about about depth around topics. I also want to just make the make the point that then within the year, but also across the year, for example, at art, you've got entomology in kindergarten, then you're moving on to wild and endangered animals in, you know, in, in first grade and looking at those adaptations. And, and you're starting to see across years kids, kids are building that knowledge. Um, and as you as you look at, it, I think that's something we we all want to see because we're in it for the for the twelve years. But I noticed a word I didn't hear from you. You know, um, I didn't hear you talk about themes. I hear you use the word topic. Is it you know are some words you know in style now and others aren't? You know, do you want to say anything about that? Well, let's make sure that we know the difference. Uh, a theme is an idea about the world. So a theme could be friendship. A theme could be. Um, supporting people a theme could be love uh, a theme could be exploration uh, whereas a topic would be insects um planets astronomy um moons arachnids etc <laughs> and, and beyond science even to other right. topics to other subjects and uh, the knowledge of when you have knowledge of a top when you have knowledge of a topic as as has been said it supports learning vocabulary so if you have if you have a theme such as friendship, one one text could be about a boy who lost his best friend in a terrible accident in fourth grade, and the next text and that could have taken place in 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 outside of Chicago, um, and the next text might be about two girls who became pen pals, one living in China, one living um, in Brazil, and they devoted a friendship. So you're not building up the knowledge sequentially or coherently um, about. China, about anything with those with that kind with that kind of approach. It's not that themes don't serve a purpose in the world. It really is that 
in terms of growing knowledge, topics do it. And in terms of growing vocabulary, topic does it, as, as Meredith said, because when you have more topic knowledge, you're more likely to determine the meaning of words in the text. We've all, all of us, even if you have not been an educator for 55 years or so, like I have, because you're not nearly as old, have heard the phrase vocabulary and context. And then it said, well, the context is the other words. That's true, but the context is also the knowledge. If you know something about amphibians and you're reading a text about salamanders, then when it comes to how that they breathe through their skin and that's why their skin needs to be moist, you'll probably pick up the meaning of the word moist, a tier two word, even if you haven't gotten to it, even if you haven't seen it before, because you understand that that's how amphibians breathe and you understand that they live in a wet or moist type of environment. So topic knowledge grows tier two vocabulary. It, knowledge is really a one-two punch. When you have series of coherent texts and the Servetian Wright study of almost that same name, which we'll put on, on, on wherever we store in these things, um, it shows that very clearly. It's a, it's a one-two punch. By reading about the world, you not only grow your knowledge of the world, but you grow your vocabulary, not just tier three vocabulary, but tier two vocabulary. But you know what? It's a, it's, a, it's a one, two, three punch. Not only do you learn about the world and not only do you learn vocabulary, but you're also likely to be more interested. Mm -hmm. What's more likely to happen? What, what's a student more likely to go home and talk about? Mom, that there really is zombies. There are all these wasps that inject venom into other wasps, carry the dead wasp's body over to where their babies are and then feed them. And then these other wasps that don't have to carry the babies, they sting the other wasps and make them into zombies that walk with them to the baby's nest and therefore they feed the babies. What's more interesting, that or well, mom, today we did standard five, the structure standard. Mm -hmm. What's more likely to get kids want to get up and go to school and become genuine intellectuals? Unfortunately, we've atomized instruction away from knowledge with an approach on comprehension strategies or even standards. We're going to talk about structure this week. Next week, you should be psyched out of your mind because we're going to do point of view. That's <laughs> what gets kids interested in the world. I, I also think themes, <clears throat> topics can be loosey-goosey. You know, they can be huge and too much. But I also think themes can be especially loosey-goosey and kids don't get them. <clears throat> I've got one example here for you. It's in the dinosaur effect, but getting from here to there. <clears throat> the first week, they study cultural exchange. Okay, that could work. Getting from here to there. You think it's about travel, right? The second week, it goes to being resourceful. The third week, they do patterns. Got me. The fourth week is teamwork. And the fifth week, they focus on an article uh, that's in the magazine for Time for Kids. So really getting from here to there, really? So I think kids don't get it. Um, I'm not even sure we've talked to some teachers who say, we don't get it. Um, why this grouping of, uh, uh, on this particular theme? We think that, um, and, and I know Meredith, you've oftentimes said that sometimes adults can be more enthralled with themes than kids. Yeah. I also, um, and, and Liz touched on this in the chat, her good comment in the chat, but the intellectual, um, it's an intellect but also the curiosity like it, it, it makes you curious i'm sort of stuck on why salamanders have to have moist why is moist you know I, like now i want to know why is moisture an element of breathing through the skin i'm like why can dry skin not breathe so i want to go so you know you get that effect too just this it opens the door to curiosity being part and parcel of the classroom and that is that does lead to intellectual exchange and kids who value you know, arguing and thinking and talking, and and it builds it builds it confidence in your own prowess as a thinker and a learner. So these, there's just a ripple effect here. You know, there's so many, yeah, and, and engagement. There's just so many ripple effects from sort of centering on text, and then that text being coherently connected to to things. You know, really, you know, the world, the, this interesting place we all cohabitate. Who would have thought learning about the world is really important? <laughs>
Well, and I'm going to, it may be one of you that said this, the idea that when you know something, it acts like Velcro, because then the next thing can stick on and the next, and that's the way that knowledge works. And I want to step outside my facilitator role for a moment and, and talk to folks that, you know, as a former school, school administrator and coach, there's a really great article in the chat that Sue referenced. These folks had a, a pretty heavy hand in called The Dinosaur Effect. It's a great book for faculty studies for really painting a picture of what, what's different and, and, and what we're talking about and how, how it really looks. And then the impact on vocabulary comprehension um, that comes through knowledge. And Barb, we're saving questions for the end, right? Or not? Is there one here um, that we really want to ask right now? Um, we can certainly do that. I saw, I did see one in the chat asking um, about accessibility of the text. So in a knowledge build, building curriculum is, is, I'm trying to look at the, the wording there. You have to make sure that students can access the text, I think is, is the point we're, that we want to get at. It's not that they all have to read the text, but that grade level instruction is really key, that making that text accessible to the kids is important rather than um, kids only being exposed to books at the level they can read, that you need grade level instruction. Yeah, yeah I think you want to go ahead, Mary. Oh, okay. Um, so there's two, there's two types of reading here that we didn't really explicate. Um, for knowledge building in this way we're talking about, you need a volume of reading. Sue referenced it, and we we also ARC is unique in having and supplying that with the with the um, classroom live with the massive libraries that go with our core in every grade. Um, so that is a volume of reading, and that needs to be at a variety of levels so that students can access it independently. That is not read. I mean, when your kids are young, it gets read to to them. But um, the, going back to the baseball effect. Kids who are knowledgeable about a topic can read beyond whatever their level is, right? There is so this whole idea of level, you know, level matching students to text is fallacious. It's just wrong. Now, that said, there are genuinely complex, rich texts that are at the heart of instruction, where you're gathering your students together to do close reading or careful and careful instructed reading. That then all students do get to access that text. If you're in third grade, you deserve to learn third grade stuff, not some dumbed down book because your decoding isn't solid yet. So it's up to teachers and we say it's up to instructional materials to bring those supports in for language learners, for kids learning English and being asked to learn to read simultaneously for kids that are not on grade level yet. So that's, we believe, hold the line, teach the text, but Act, make sure there are access points, entry points, and supports for teachers to support students. So I hope that. And I, I'd also add, Meredith, for students to support students, because yeah. mm -hmm. we all <clears throat> have different uh, bases of knowledge, and we are interested in things. And the whole point here is to, bring, to have a community of learners. So yes, it's the teacher as a structure of a lot of that, but a lot of discussions where students are enriching other students. And I've heard um, sometimes teachers talk about some of their more um, struggling readers getting really excited because one, they know when they're learning the good stuff and when somebody's respecting their brain, that's number one, but also they get excited and that they um, oftentimes contribute just as much as someone who maybe got it really fast or, or didn't need quite as much as quite as much support. The point is when we did leveled reading, when that was all there was, kids were handed a book and they were to go off and sit and go do it. Um, not a lot, a little tiny bit of teacher support, but not a lot. But in this case, we really are talking about regular, and David can speak to this too, sort of regular times when you are in a unit, you've got a complex text that's at the anchoring that unit, and then working <clears throat> to make sure that you help students understand it and, and can move through it in a variety of ways. That if they don't ever have any time or experience with that, they can never learn to do that. And, you know, I, I want to just give a concrete example. And David and Meredith shouted out the volume of reading and art. Um, one of the things we're really careful about in our units is that there are core texts 
at or above grade level that really help you drive key understandings about knowledge, as well as the ELA standard, the writing standard that serve as an anchor. So everybody's getting access to the banquet. And that's part of what Sue's talking about. And then whoever you are, there, there's collections of books in your classroom, right? And, and I think one of the things we do is we carefully curate across a bunch of text complexities, things that go with the topic. So that, you know what, if you are two years below grade level, you still can be part of the academic community. Um, if you're two years above grade level, you can still be part of that study on animal adaptations. And so you're being fed um, in a really rich way. That is not putting kids into, dare I say, the old guided reading groups where students only had access to whatever level they were at. And that's what we're really talking about here. Um, um, so we're not you know, saying, you know, Lexile level's bad or early level's bad. We're talking about grade level instruction, volume of practice, and if kids are gonna get the depth of knowledge, they need that high level from the teacher, and they also need to be able to access things on their own as part of a really rich academic community. I, I, I'm seeing some questions. I know that's something that folks want to chew on. Um, I, I think I, I want to, is there anybody who wants, Meredith, Sue, David, do you want to say anything else before we move on a little bit to uh, the tool you're, you've developed as part I, of this to help schools? Can I tell a story from, from AUK? Absolutely. Um, so I was observing this class, and I, I, I don't remember what the topic was, in, insects, um, space, doesn't matter. And after the lesson with the core text, each kids were doing their, their assignments. And as, as Barbara said, kids had to deal with, with text at different levels to read for a volume of reading. So if they if they study if they were studying insects, they have volume of reading about insects, a number of texts at different levels. And, and I remember I sat down right in front of these two kids in front and there was a, this, uh, I guess it was fifth to sixth grade, this tall boy and a, and a much shorter girl for that means, but just, I'm getting a picture in my mind. And he was clearly a very superior reader and she was not, you know, she, she was struggling. And I asked them some questions about the lesson and, you know, she kind of got it. And, and when, she, when she couldn't explain it, he picked it up clearly. And then at the end, she pulled out her book. That was her book for the volume of reading that they were doing. And she was clearly so proud of this book because it was part of her research topic. And she spoke very eloquently about that. So there you had two kids, one who was quite sure it was a top reader in the class and one of whom was not. But they both were, but the weak reader was clearly invested in learning and in her in, and in her topic. Because in addition to that, getting the benefit of the complex text that was that the whole class was reading, she had a bunch of books on her topic connected to insects that she could read. And as she read more on that topic, believe me, she was able to grab accelerate to more complex text. Um, so it it brings everybody in. I think that beautifully illustrates to Sue's point about kids helping each other. Now, you folks have been working at this and many other things for decades. And I love, David, the way you began with saying, hey, cognitive scientists knew many of these things um, decades ago. And yet, you know, we're having this resurgence of knowledge, uh, this rediscovery of it. Um, so how are you helping practitioners, states, understand these principles, use them in, ad in adoptions, use them in classrooms. What, what are you doing to try to take this from the research and the examples into practice in more places? Is that a good setup? That's a good setup. I don't know if we're gonna show slides or not, or just talk. Um, so there's something called the- um, We do have some slides. Soon. Yeah, we do. 
Um, so we put um, a tool together and I'm not going to go through all of these. There's eight dimensions. Um, and what I, the only, I think a couple points I want to, so there's vocabulary and challenging text and a volume of reading and discussions and writing and targeted supports and ease of enacting curriculum. Um, and I think the point, one point I want to make is that they're interconnected. So when we talk about the dimension of uh, challenging text, we're talking about you know, fulsome discussions that students are having. We talk about culminating assignments and you can go through each one and find the connections. They're very easy when you start to think about vocabulary development or writing or whatever, all connected um, to one another. And I would just say, and that Meredith, I don't know if we're gonna do this now or in a little bit, but there's the first dimension, which is the laser-like focus on what matters most for literacy. Yeah, there's a slide on it. Um, okay. This, this was the, this is the new first slide, right, Michael? So um, he's, okay, so. Yeah. But um, just to say it, when we get to it, it is our, we are trying to strike a blow at um, Basil's um, or other big bloated yeah. um, curricula uh, to really stay really, really focused on um, what matters most. So it, it outlines the complex text and vocabulary and so on and so forth, but then they get explicated um, down below. Um, and I also wanna say, um, and as someone, um, as three people who worked on the Common Core State Standards, um, we say their rightful place, which is um, uh, certainly you want to pay attention to it. And we've heard Barbara talk eloquently about the complex text and how important it is and the progression so students are prepared. Yes, yes, yes. But it's not to be the focus of, and we heard David talk about that. It's not the standard of the week or the standard of the day um, that, that makes a difference. It's really, what are you reading? And why does it matter? And what is the author telling us? And so to really stay focused on that. And then the other thing that's really important is strategies, because I feel like as someone who came up um, almost as many decades as David, <laughs> um, that it we sort of lost why we read. read. It was kind of like, well, we were supposed to become good readers, and but it didn't matter that we learned anything. We just were supposed to become good readers. Because and it's and strategies have a base, but it's it and students need to learn them, but they can learn them quickly and then maintain them quickly um, through through the year. So that's the eight dimensions. And the next slide, um, can we just pull out those. So what so what what we did that what you're seeing is a tool that was developed. Um, it's by not the Knowledge Matters campaign, which oh, is yeah, that would be good to say, wouldn't yeah. it? Which is a which is a, a project of Standards Work, which has. Barbara noted Sue founded with a couple of other, other women um, a long time ago. So the Knowledge Matters campaign is a campaign um, to coordinate districts and publishers and states and schools together uh, that this matters. Like it matters to bring children rich knowledge, good materials. Um, if you don't mind going back, Michael, there was one other thing. So there, we made this tool that has eight dimensions. These are the these are those. It's not intended. It's not a scorecard. You can't rate it. We don't tell you. You know, if you get forty points, you're winning. Or you know, green says go, red says slam on the brakes. We aren't doing rating. We are. Ed it's an educating tool that to add to to make the to make the discussion be more full blooded. Um, around picking curriculum and what matters. This is all based on the research, which that's why David spent so long laying the groundwork on research. This it, We have a version of this that lays the research out on each of these. I also wanna just talk a second. We're gonna come back to one, as Sue said, but this is unusual to see in a tool, laser-like focus on what matters for literacy. Don't, you know, we, we wouldn't care if there was no fluff at all. What matters, what has a research base, do those things in the classroom for students and they will they will soar. And then eight is also unusual. You don't see this. We're not saying curriculum can't have lots of moving parts and be complex, but consider the ease of enacting it. How many years will it take to get teachers up, up to speed? Do you have 40% teacher turnover because you're um, a pretty beleaguered system? You may not want something that takes three or four years to get comfortable with because your teachers will all be gone that were there in year one. Or is still inordinately difficult to, to implement yeah. even when you have some experience. Right. Right. So exactly. There's yeah. just too much. There's just too well, much. Anyway, that's do. that's all I wanted to say on that slide. Back and back to you, Sue. All right. So just zippity doo dying through. So um each dimension has criteria um so that we spell it out. 
And um, you might say, okay, how is this different from standards? And you will notice here that um, yes, the standards include vocabulary actually in each one of the domains, really important, but there's more of the how to here. So what words do you choose? And really, really important, what the research tells us is that students have to <clears throat> use those words and phrases in their, in their conversations, in their writing. So throughout, you will see that we reference if, in some ways or reflect the standards, but it goes much further than what to do, but how to do it. And, and, and there's a, as Meredith said, there's a rating piece here you can do, but um, you, know, you, can, you can do that by looking at your curriculum um, or selecting a new one, or you can just do it as part of a professional learning team. So next slide. So supported by the research. So as Meredith said, there's another version, or was it Barbara who said it? Another version that shows you the research um, for each one of the uh, criteria. Next slide. Why this tool, why now? Okay. So we know Ed reports, reviews, and structural materials, and it's based on standards alignment, which is important um, because there's a progression of skills, right? So uh, we wanna say it's important, it provides a floor. Um, and I think Barbara, you helped us with some of that language too, as you were talking about Ed reports and the importance of it. I want you to see that um, we, we thought that decision makers needed more guidance um, and we wanted to give you all more guidance. And notice the fourth one down, the tool names the how to do's, not just the what to do. So it's the how to do's and the what to do's, which becomes um, uh, really important. And Meredith, I don't know if you wanna add anything there. Well, I just, um, I realize we have some insider lingo here. H-Q-I-M yeah. is a overused acronym. Um, and I, I usually don't like them and I, I let this one slide through. High quality instructional materials. That is sort of a code for the things that we believe um, do a good job of helping teachers, like right, instructional materials help teachers do their jobs. That's that's what a that's what a program does, should do. And so we're we're kind of the gadfly saying do better, do it at least this well. These are the things we'd love to see because they're good for kids. They have a research base. They have good outcomes for kids. So that's and what we're hoping we're hoping publishers pay attention too. By the way, yes. And, but we're not the only ones who use the term HQ. No, no, yeah. no. But there may be people on the call. I know, right. I know. I'm just saying it's not. Yeah, I didn't make us. it up. I didn't make it up, but I'm just translating. That's all. Okay. Next slide. So <clears throat> we had gotten questions um, already on the, if you haven't um, gone to the Knowledge Matters website, um, you will find that we have profiled um, a curricula. I want to proudly say that ARC is one of them, um, that we've considered to be exemplars of knowledge, rich, high quality instructional materials. And as we just talked about Ed reports, you know, there's that green, red, yeah, green, yellow, red. And we want to expand and refine the conversation beyond all greens. It's almost like an HQIM plus plus or something like that. And the other thing is, and this gets to Meredith and David's book, which is the science of reading. You begin to hear this now sort of rumble around the country, which is really, really good, which is that science of reading is it, really important to have foundational skills. Yay, yay. Um, you know, gosh, it's been so long since we've been sort of fighting that battle. You know, I think we're on, maybe on the winning side of that. Um, but it's also about knowledge matters. Um, and, 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 and what that means. So it's not just reading, it's reading, writing, talking, vocabulary development, equity, et cetera. Um, so we wanted to do that. And then we wanted to give everybody sort of an inside look when we profiled these eight curricula, what do we look at? Sort of a backward map, if you will, and then provide an important tool for professional learning. Next slide. Next slide, <laughs> sorry. Meredith, do you wanna take this one? Sure. This is um, what, what I talked about before. That first dimension is really crucial and unusual. Um, this idea of a laser-like focus on what matters most for literacy. So we consider it the uber dimension. The N is cut off by that dude with the spyglass. Um, so, so what matters most? That's that's the question. Um, and it's and it's on the next slide. <laughs> So David, do you want to take these? Uh, let everybody take a minute to just look at these bullets, please. 
And we've kind of discussed them, haven't we? Yeah, so, we have. Yeah, I'm looking for what we haven't discussed. Yeah. No, we've touched on all of these. Yeah. And again, they <clears throat> one builds on another. So you can imagine when you're talking about vocabulary, right? You're talking about what students are reading, what they're writing, what they're talking about. So um, while they appear sort of siloed when you look at them like this, when you get within the tool, they are they are uh, they are connected. Let me just quickly address something that doesn't get the attention it deserves, and that's volume of reading. Oh, we have talked about. It. I know, but I, I still think okay. it's hard to do volume of reading because the day is so full in elementary school classes, and getting kids to read at home is becoming more and more difficult. So finding a way to get volume of reading into the school day is, is essential, and I completely recognize the difficulty of doing that. I reckon, I appreciate, David, that you keep going back to that. And I think right now, in, in this moment, teachers are, are so worried about time that sometimes getting that volume of reading practice, teachers are, are worried they're not standing up and doing direct instruction. But the, there's a lot of research on practice in and outside of reading, the need to build stamina, all the way to Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours to get good at something. Yep, yep. There's, if you don't practice, it's common sense. If you don't practice, you aren't going to get good enough to love it, be skilled at it. Um, and so I appreciate that point. And also the acknowledgement, because you're in a lot of classrooms, it's tough. Yeah. And and we do, we, we, we also want to call ARC out because of these the eight programs, this is a thorny, thorny question. How do you get enough volume of reading in a busy school day? ARC is structured to do it. It is really the, it is unique in that way. Um, it, it, it is, it's baked into the DNA of it. And some of the other high quality instructional materials struggle to move beyond the complex text and the instructional time spent there to really get the volume of reading. And it is essential for student for students to grow with and, and go. And, you know, sometimes we've heard about <clears throat> students silent reading in class and what does it mean besides they're reading something good, but these lightweight accountability, we just heard the story from what David told where one student was sharing with another student something they had done extra research. And that's something else I think that ARC does and some of the others, which is there's lightweight uh, accountability ways so that you actually know that the student is, is actually spending time reading. Now, hopefully it's really interesting and engaging so they're, you don't have a problem with that. But I know that sometimes um, you, you, people worry about sort of students off in the corners reading because they don't know if that's what they're really doing. I love that phrase, lightweight accountability. Things like accountable talk, exit tickets, um, rating your favorite books, or using a graphic organizer to note information in your research. Yeah. Um, all of those things, or to bring back to the text-based discussion. Finding, um, working with a teacher on the complex text whole group, and then applying it to the book that you have, um, or all just, and then sharing that in the community are all great examples. As I'm listening to you, it made me think about the role of writing. As we're talking about curriculums, and I realized we touched on that only lightly, but many of the knowledge-based curriculums use some form of a culminating project that requires writing, and that backwards design with the text, with coherent text, really drives things from beginning to end. Do you guys want to say anything else about writing or about how writing can, can be a through line in all of this? Yes, do it a lot. <clears throat> That's one thing we talk about in the tool is that, um, like, again, the standards mention the different types of writing, so make it varied, but also that you need to do it regularly and that it be connected to what you're reading. Now, sometimes it can be more, more indirectly connected than directly connected, but we sometimes you'll see programs, Barbara, that um, they've got a whole sort of silo, the writing, <laughs> like all of a sudden you're going to write about something. I mean, I watch this with my grandkids come home with a writing assignment. It's nothing they've read. They're supposed to make up stuff, I guess. Um, and so it really, it's connecting. There's, and there's research that says that, and think about it yourself, if you have to write something about what you've learned, you have to know it better because I have to be able to communicate it to you. And I have to first formulate it in my head in a way that makes more sense. And so there's research about that. Well, I think um, you're implying it deepens comprehension there too, my friend. That's right. It definitely does. And I 
I want to again toss this one of my favorite mantras, um, which is from the writing collaborative. I didn't make it up, but the, there shouldn't be there shouldn't be any gotchas in school. Kids don't come to school to get over, and and we shouldn't be jabbing at them like gotcha. I caught you. I caught you doing this thing. You know, like. Um, and that's true of writing. When students are writing, when I'm writing a, a high stakes email to my siblings or any or work or any context, I rehearse it with people. I either do it, I mean, I have the skills to do it in my head, but sometimes I talk it through with somebody like, is this too harsh? Can you look at this? So, the, so discussion and writing should also be really mixed. And again, you can't overestimate what learning the stuff you read about does for fueling the ideas in your brain that you you're dying then to put down on paper so there again this things flow together in a good curriculum they're not freestanding and and um atomized i would only add one thing kindergarten first grade second grade third grade really well into fifth grade errs write slowly <laughs> um Every time they're asked to write something, it does not have to be perfect grammar, perfect sentence structure, or perfect punctual, or, or perfect anything. There are times for that, but especially with something like close reading, asking kids to organize their thoughts and write is super helpful, but that doesn't mean it has to be a, a, an example of perfect writing every time because it'll take freaking forever. <laughs> David, also, isn't it also that sometimes you might do a longer piece, right? But you might have a short piece, like paraphrase what we've just talked about or what we've just read. So it's that, and, and you know, you hear about people, I know people um, uh, my age who are afraid of writing because they never did much of it. So this notion that writing is um, an okay thing to do, a fun thing to do, um, and to do it often uh, m makes you feel, you know, sort of more, more in control and more ready and understand you have those ideas in your head to share. Yes, I agree. So we, we have to leave this, this guy out, this slide. Uh, Meredith, I may hand this over to you because okay. I hear my voice going. Okay, so this is quick because we already mentioned it. Next slide, please. These are just place caps. So again, there are a lot of other tools um, and 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 we aren't we don't want to supplant any of those. We just think that there's no other tool that builds on the research base that we keep harping on. Um, and that's the research base for doing what's in blue here, for attaining proficiency in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So this one focuses there. That is its place in the somewhat busy landscape. Um, there are other good tools, and we actually called them out um, on the right um, that are that that have important roles. And frankly, they were built by institutions that have more resources and um, know there's no no things than um, than we did. We 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 didn't do foundational skills because first of all, it was a knowledge matters campaign. And so it wasn't, you know, it was, we wanted to focus where we focused. And um, the Reading League has an extremely comprehensive tool, almost obsessively comprehensive, I think, um, which makes sense because the Reading League was, you know, founded by, by, for children with learning disabilities. So at its heart. So, and then English Language Success Forum and the Council of the Great City Schools, um, both always keep their eyes on multilingual learners and have laid out some really beautiful must-haves. So there are other places we didn't want to recreate where places are doing very thorough or um, good jobs. And I think the analogy of Ed Reports giving everybody a floor to stand on is um, an important one too. So that's that slide. So Sue already mentioned this, so you can just look at this as a recap. Um, this can be good professional learning because it is instructionally focused. What does it look like? How do you do it um, in these areas? We really point at that. And if you're a wonk, you can go get the research version and read all the research you want about each of these components and why they're so um, vital. And Sue said this, you can look, if you're not in an adoption cycle, look at your current materials. Nothing is perfect. This tool's not, but we're pretty proud of it. Uh, look at your current materials and see where you might have to backfill or, or supplement or are they really um, beyond repair and you should push for another adoption. Could, yeah, go for it. Um, can we go back to the previous slide? I, I could see where someone at the district level that is putting together a team for um, ado an adoption 
He said, oh, so what are we going to do? We have to, we're going to look at Ed reports for standards. We're going to look at the reading league for foundational skills. We're going to look at the uh, English language success forum for our multi-language learners um, and, and maybe the council of great city schools also. Um, I mean, and they said, we have to go through all that. We're talking about decisions that are often in the millions of dollars, not to mention all the aggravation. If you choose a program and it's the wrong program and your teachers don't like it and you're not getting results. So I think it is a lot of work. Um, personally, I happen to think our tool is the best of all these because it's the most comprehensive and the easiest to use. But I can understand if some other people feel otherwise. But, and, but even if going through all this is something that you might want to say it's worth the time and worth, worth, worth the effort because it's a, it's a huge decision. And unfortunately, and I was just working with just today with one district that chose the wrong curriculum only two years ago and is already done with it. Um, and that's really a problem. In addition to the millions of dollars, think of the alienation that produces with teachers. Okay, now we're going to go in a new curriculum. You just told us the one we just finished two years with was, was going to solve all our problems, and it didn't. You lose a lot of credibility that way. David, that's a great point. And you have a number uh, of curriculum directors and principals on the screen, and it creates an implementation fatigue and also yeah. just a lack of trust in the district. It's like using uh, implementing a curriculum, teachers put their heart and soul in that. And... Um, in addition to the kids depending on us, the teachers are depending on us too, because the hours they're spending planning, trying to figure things out. So when it begins to feel like a merry-go-round, you know, uh, one of the mics, Smoker or Fuller, and talks about um, initiative fatigue being like Teflon, nothing sticks after a while. So I think in addition to the dollars, there's a human capital cost to being on an adoption merry-go-round. And I think, it, you know, if you remember nothing else and you're looking at adoption, it's like, get off the merry-go-round, you know? Yeah. yeah, if anybody's interested, I just read a research piece, an interesting research piece on what exactly are the elements of a successful um, professional adaptation, including uh, including the professional learning that it, when, when does it work in terms of the procedures for the adaptation, the procedures for the professional learning and the procedures for the implementation. And it was, it was an interesting study with like, I think five or seven or eight school districts, some of which were very large. It's horrific writing. They really ought to sign up to the Meredith Lieben Sue Pimentel writing <laughs> or something because they butchered the human language. They, they, they butchered language. But the ideas were um, were worth it. If anybody's interested, they can just email, reach out to me. Why don't you just send it to Art? I'll send it to Art. Thank and, you. And David, think That's about great. where you know. Our, our, tells me what to do. Well, um, there's no email. Nobody, nobody knows how to get hold of you. So. You see, I've lost control of this conversation if I if I ever had it. And I hope you all enjoy this because this is really like. <laughs> Being at at the cocktail party with these experts and being in an insider conversation, so I I, I hope you folks are all um, enjoying this as much as I am. I have to cut in here. Anything yeah. David mentioned, we will share. Uh, there's a question about the slides. Uh, if we have the permission of our of our group, um, and they they may want to look at them again. Um, but we we're happy to share them. But I I do want to end here with a word of advice from each of you. I've tried to work in some of the group questions throughout the conversation. Um, I'll, I'll try to take the very last word, but I'd like each of you to just one, one bit of advice. And again, our audience here, literacy coaches, school and district administrators, you know, folks who are on the front lines of this work. I'll, st I'll, I'll just do a, I mean, it could be many different things and probably people on the phone know just as, or on the Zoom know just as much as I do. But I think one thing that I would watch in instruction is how much time is spent on strategies, instruction and standards instruction versus really engaging knowledge building. Um, so I, that would that would be my words to watch that because I think we've been, conditioned to think that we have to hammer away at strategies and as 
And Shannon says, you only need the strategies when you can't understand the text and you've got a problem. So you don't have to do strategies and, and certainly standards. So that would be, I think that would be my piece of advice. I would only add to that, it's the same thing with standards. If we try to shoehorn the standards into every text, and, and our book is really good about this, uh, on what chapters? Um, <laughs> um, six, seven, and eight. Six, seven, and eight. Um, you know, you, you say this, but this, this week, the, stand, the standard of this week is point of view, or at this point of view. Well, it may be that the text you're reading, um, the point of view is overwhelmingly obvious. Um, and in, in every in every way, and not even that important to understanding the text, but we're going to spend the whole week on point of view regardless. Um, and, and so it's connected to exactly what Sue said, but it can work with strategies or, or it could work with standards. And if there's too much of that, it's not really building knowledge because it's, there's a fine, it's a, time is a precious commodity um, in, in, in schools. And if you're spending time on strategies and standards that you don't need to, the more you spend on that, the less you're spending on knowledge and the less you're spending on understanding the text. And I will um, rhyme with those and say, you know, Sue and, Sue and I wrote a paper that David contributed to heavily called Text at the Center. And you reading is, and text, and it, it is the vehicle for all, it is the, the hub around which all the rest of the activity should go. That's where the knowledge building should happen. That's what the writing should stem from. And it should drive the challenges that students encounter with the text should drive the use of strategies, you know, because they get confused and they have to do something. They have to reread. They have to, you know, they have to monitor their comprehension more carefully. That's how they learn to be good readers is by engaging with text. And Barbara made that point almost at the top of the hour. So with volume of reading. Um, so text at the center in a curriculum that doesn't do that, that has a gazillion other things going on, run the other way. Or if you already own it and you're no adoptions on the horizon, pare it down, focus on the text worth reading, ask the questions worth asking, and do the writing and the other work worth doing around the text. So just throw out 90% and, and make it your own, you know, your own unique implementation your kids will do better than somebody who tried to do the whole the whole pack i just want to say a, a big thank you i always feel feel both affirmed and stretched by conversations with you and i love the way that you all model continuing to learn and be curious and inquire and that i think for all of us here who are are, are working in schools or with schools i think that's really inspiring one of the things I'm walking away with from all of this and really from your advice is why are we doing what we're doing? Is it worth doing? You know, you can't read reading for its own sakes. You need to read about something and then you need to do something with it. You same thing with writing. We heard, you know, kids are writing about, you know, and again, one of my all time horror stories is what would you do if you're invited to the teddy bear picnic? You know, kids are writing about things that don't matter. So at the end of the day, the teddy bear picnic, that's great true story, true story. Um, that was a, a, an assessment prompt. Um, so I just want to say, and these things may seem silly, but you guys are, are, are working in your daily lives, folks out there are participating. And I think the knowledge matters tool cuts through the noise and brings focus. And I think discussions around that, taking a pause, whether you're adopting or just looking at your curriculum to think about, you know, why are we getting the results we're getting? It's very useful. So thank you all. Um, carry on. You're all doing important work out there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.